So I am Reverend Vahisha Hassan. So lovely to be in this place with all of you. And I am gonna begin with a voice that I honor respect in this work, um, a piece from Recipicence 2020, a Lenten devotional for dismantling white supremacy. It will tell you a whole lot about her and a whole lot about me and a whole lot about the work that I'm involved in. I was one of the co-editors of this, of this work. Reverend Wavette Blair Lavallee began her piece, shout, fall, holler, outcry, utter, testify. This holler is God's warning bell in the boxing ring of justice. The day of the Lord is coming when God will no longer tolerate the hypocrisy of the holy. When it comes an invitation to return to God with all your hearts, with fasting, with weeping, and with sorrow. Tear your hearts and not your clothing. Repent. God wants to hear the outcry of the powers that be. Get ready to mourn the loss of patriarchy, of privilege, of legacy. Put on the sackcloth of sorrow so that all who are coming up on the rough side of the mountain may hear the utterances of the powerful begging for forgiveness in God's mercy. Start grieving the dismantling of the systems of the wealthy that were built on the backs of the marginalized. Immigrants, women, indigenous people are shouting, get right with the Lord. Get right with God's people, testify. It's a holy rallying cry, a prophetic proclamation. Do it because God said so. This speaks to who I am, to the work that I do. I'm grateful to be in this space and I am doing this because God said so. So I am the program director at Claiborne Temple. We do economic justice work expressed through arts and culture and community. We are in a majorly black city, city with this Memphis, Tennessee, and we have some of the highest economic disparities, not altogether unchanged since the sanitation workers strike in 1968. Now y'all know this is 2022. So in 1968, two black men were crushed in the back of a sanitation truck. And from that protest, from that shout, that squall, holler, outcry, uttering, testify, they lifted signs declaring that I am a man. And today in 2022 in Memphis, Tennessee, we are still lifting our, our signs and we are declaring that I am a man, I am a woman, I am a human because economically and racially and in so many other ways, we are still being crushed. I'm also the executive director of Movement and Faith. This is a parachurch organization that works at the intersection of faith, social justice, and mental health and wellness. It is my jam. I love it. It's my baby. And it grew out of the protests in Charlotte, uh, resistance from a Black man being murdered by the Charlotte Police Department. I'm also the board chair at Transform Network. This is a progressive faith, this is a resourcing place for progressive faith folks for social change, social impact, actions type work. And then lastly, I say lastly, but I stay doing the most. But if y'all fund the work, you know what I mean? Maybe I can pick one or two. We'll talk about that later. I am also, <laughs> I am also the rapid response coordinator at TRAC. TRAC is Trauma Response and Crisis Care for Movement. This is trauma-informed care for liberators. This is for those engaging wellness, right? Wellness support for those engaging in social change work that have experienced in their life and in their past and are then also experiencing trauma as they fight for collective liberation. Right now in Memphis, we have a uh, first week of school, right? And a young, a young child was body slammed to the ground for wearing open back shoes in a school where schools are being treated like prisons, right? And so folks who are, I'm getting all of these messages and how we're organizing around a response to this, but the video of it, the video of it, is deeply disturbing. So this is this is a traumatic thing that has happened to this young child, trauma that we're all experiencing watching the video. And how do we how do we do better at this? How do we have 
so much more wellness as we do this work. We are not well. We're not a well people, not a well society. We don't have well systems. We are not in well relationships with each other. And we are absolutely not in well relationship with the earth, right? So closing of my part of my time and really want to tying in trauma and wellness to the, the, the way we are fighting for liberation and what we are striving for, what we are resisting against. In Between the World and Me, Tanahisi Coates says, all our phrasing, race relations, racial chasms, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscles, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. Even still, wellness is available, y'all. Embracing healing is available and possible. And this requires well systems and well people. Fund that work. Fund those doing well work for well systems for wellness. Fund the healing essential to sustaining these people and that work. Look forward to talking more about this with y'all. Thank you. so much Reverend Hassan I appreciate that grounding um it's always a wonderful reminder that we need to center ourselves and center our bodies around the healing and the healing of these systems that we have to operate in so I appreciate that next um Mav if you Nav Segrest if you could please introduce yourself and tell us about the work that you're doing um around white supremacy and Christian white nationalism well hi I'm Mav I'm zooming in from Durham and as I've thought about this and talked some to the um, brilliant comrades I'm um, talking with today, I always remember the story, in some ways my, my story starts in the Tuskegee Methodist Church when I'm 13 years old, I'm sitting in the choir, I don't sing very well, I try to sing as a soprano, but I'm really an alto, but I can't keep it up. But, but anyway, that's, a, that's not quite the story. But I see this commotion in the back of the church and my dad is, um, an usher, and now he's got this new position of welcomer, um, which means he and the other white men, when they know that Black people are approaching to integrate the church, this was SNCC in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1963, they run out and lock the door. They lock the door. So the welcomer locks the door on the Black demonstrators on the other side. So I know this is happening. And I also look over here at the church windows and I think they're beautiful windows. Um, there's Jesus in Gethsemane. There's Jesus as a shepherd with a little lamb. And right at the end, there's, there's a, a, a window of Jesus knocking at the door. He kind of got his head cocked to one side. And I have been to Sunday school. I've been to church, I've been to MIF. So I know the Bible verse is knock and it'll be open to you and seek and you will find. So here I am, it's a really pivotal moment for me in my humanness, I think. It's just this kind of tilt of the head from Jesus lock, lock, knocking at the door and my father and other men of the church locking people out. And as I've meditated on that, that really visceral embodied experience there, um, I realized that when I real like, the truth of the gospel was coming through the window at me by the light, through that through that stained glass window that carried Jesus' text, knocking them to be open. And yet the institution I was in, white segregated South Methodist Church, was doing just the opposite. And in that moment, I, I thought that I had left the church. I certainly left that emotionally I did. Um, but it took me a good many years to realize that the real church was on the other side of the door. The real church was on the other side of the door. And for white people who lock other people out, we also lock ourselves in. So a lot of my work since then is kind of trying to be honest to that child who's asked those questions and really wanted answers. So in, in the 1980s, I came to Duke to graduate school, but really I started organizing against the Klan and Nazis in the 90s because North Carolina had the worst Klan and Nazis in the country and 
my folks had been claiming Nazis in North Carolina, and I'd run away from that, so I really wanted to do it. And I did that for the rest of the for the rest of that decade, and we did some really good work. I mean, we busted some of them up. I wrote a book called Memoir of a Race Trader about that and about my family. Very conservative, to be polite, Southern family. Uh, as and I also was trying to deal with being a lesbian, so. Um, so my work was part of what we later came to call intersectionality, where you don't leave yourself behind, you don't do race and gender over here or sexuality over there, that we need movements and, and theologies and relationships that really let us all come in the door. In the 1990s, I worked with the World Council of Churches and the Urban Rural Mission in the United States, um, which was trying to bring um, radical theologians and community organizers together in conversations all around the globe. It was one of the more radical programs of the World Council. In the 19, in the 2000s, I went to Connecticut and worked as a professor, but um, I always was doing community work. It was always intersectional. It was always anti-racist. And I helped to found Song in 1993, um, still going. So I've really worked, um, I've done the best I could as a white person to be accountable to myself and to other people and to find ways. And one of, one of my little lanes there too has been fighting the right, tracking the right, whom I consider my relatives really. I did it in the 1980s. And when I came back to North Carolina with Trump and all this stuff, you know, it's still a very viable thing to do. So now I'm working with Blueprint North Carolina and my friend Serena Sebring, who's doing a brilliant job as executive director, mapping the far right in North Carolina because clearly they're in the resurgence, they're very dangerous. Uh, and they're in our backyards, they're across the street, they're turning the dogs out of us on the road. So we're, we're, we really have a project that I hope will be a model to really map at the county level who the insurgents are, who the various versions of white supremacy are, um, and what to do, do about them. What are strategies local people can use and how do we protect our communities from this kind of white Christian nationalism, which I think probably is also Christian fascism at this point. So. I'm very glad to be here and, and with y'all and in this conversation still. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mav, for that. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna push it right to Eric, Reverend, Reverend Eric Williams. Thank you so much for being here. And I would love to hear from you um, and your connections to this work. When that brown skinned Palestinian Jew stepped on the scene, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to the house of Bethany, the protocols, those made poor by society, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord now, which meant the Jubilee, the canceling of all debts. And so Jesus closed the book and he said, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. They said, well, how can you say that only the Messiah can? He said, I am he. And Jesus went around from town and place, letting it be known that he came to do the will of God. And so I bring you greetings today as an ambassador of that kingdom. Someone who understands that when Jesus stepped on the scene, he wasn't talking about having white Christian nationalism. He talked about doing God's work. Jesus was one who came to walk this earth to ensure that the poor, come on somebody, put poor in the chat for me, that the poor were taken care of, that the marginalized were taken care of, that the orphans and the widows and the LGBTQI and all those who have been pushed out by society were taken care of. Because if you read the scripture, I ain't never seen it said anywhere about an abortion. Have you? If you've seen it, let me know. I've never seen anywhere in the scripture where it talks about um, same-sex marriages. Jesus, did he say anything? He never did. He always talked about bringing people um, to the center so that their lives could be taken into full perspe perspective in the ways that God wanted them to live. And so I'm grateful for this conversation today because what we're hearing a lot from white Christian nationalism is not what Jesus said. And not only is it not what Jesus said, but they're actually taking policy and legislation and implementing it, lying and saying, that's what Jesus said. Oh, come on, somebody today. We know Roe versus Wade has nothing to do with scripture. It has nothing to do with the issues of our society, but it is because white 
supremacists want to stay in power. They want to keep the majority and therefore they will use the name of Jesus to use it to implement structures that will keep our people bound and oppressed. And so I am Erica Williams, uh, ambassador, as I said, but I'm also an organizer with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. And I want to be clear, Jesus was the originator of the Poor People's Campaign. I told you what he said in the beginning. And not only that, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who came along, and thank you, my sister Vahisha, for bringing in the two sanitation workers that were crushed in Memphis, Tennessee. That's why Dr. King was there, because he was standing on the side of the oppressed. And we must be very clear, they didn't kill Dr. King because he had a dream. They killed him because he had a plan. And that plan was the Poor People's Campaign, to bring together poor whites, black, brown, First Nation folks, to say to America, be what you said you would be. And we know America didn't say what they would be, because when they said, we the people, that didn't include most of us. It included white, cisgender men. And so that is who we're trying to keep in power. That's why white supremacy, excuse me, white Christian nationalism, or we can say white supremacy, I was right, is the rule of the day in America. And we see that from the highest court all the way down to the boardrooms in most of our places. And so I'm very clear with the Poor People's Campaign. King saw three things in 68. He saw racism, poverty, and militarism. But what the campaign has now come back and said, you must include ecological devastation. Because I want to sound the alarm. I'm sitting at home today in Flint, Michigan, where my family is still drinking bottled water. I don't care about it being eight years later. It may not be in the international news, but I'm telling you, my mama just drank a bottle of water this morning because the pipes have not been cleaned here in Flint because of the simple fact government believe that it is more important to take care of profits and take care of corporations than to take care of the people. And that's because they believe that some deserve and some don't. And so with the campaign, ecological devastation was added in this new mark, but we've also added Christian nationalism, because America is right now sitting in a space where we promote Christianity as the rule of this nation, and we oppress so many others from our Muslim kinfolk, from our uh, Jewish kinfolk, from all of the various traditions. We claim Christianity as the only way, and I know I'm a reverend, but I'm going to be real clear. Jesus ain't just the way, the truth, and the life. There are many ways to God. Y'all can put me out if you want me to after I've said it, but I need it to be known to day that it is not just about Christianity. God came for all people. That's what Jesus said. And so we've got to get clear in this time in our moment, because see, just like Jesus came and did his thing in his inaugural message, when the people came on January 6th, anybody know J6? Let me be very clear. They set it off in that capital, honey. And they set it off in the name of Yeshua ben Joseph, Jesus Christ, because they said that God had sent them there to reclaim democracy. God has sent them there to take back this nation. And I don't know about you, but that ain't the Jesus I serve. The Jesus that I serve was flipping tables in the money changes. And then, excuse me, with the money changes and talking against the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the day, Jesus said, you are not doing the will of my God, my God, the one that sent me. So we must address white Christian nationalism. I'm stirred up and ready to go because I was in Buffalo yesterday. I was there and I visited Topps grocery store where well, that white brother walked in there and killed our people. Ha, huh, come on somebody. I'm feeling that thing because I could not believe that somebody had the audacity to walk into that grocery store and kill folks. Thinking of that dear grandmother who, that could have been my grandmother who went to the grocery grocery store every day. And not only that, my grandmother went to the Save-A-Lot that was the only grocery store in our community because we live in a food apartheid. And so at the end of the day, I could not believe it, but I know it's America because they did it in 2015 when they walked into Mother Emanuel and killed our kinfolk at that church. And so we got to be very clear, they're not playing with us. So if we're going to get serious about doing this work of justice, we've got to be honest and say white Christian nationalism is the rule of the day. And if we don't address it, if we don't come against it, if we don't stop funding it, we will find ourselves in a place that we will not be able to return from. And so I greet you today in the name of that Palestinian Jesus. And I'm honored to be with you all today because I do know Jesus came for the oppressed and the marginalized. And that is who we must keep at the center of our conversation. Ashe and amen. All right. So we're going to dive into this conversation. And I think this is, the, this is the most timely place that we can be in right now so we can understand and give guidance from these three wonderful people around how we begin to shake this thing up and start breaking down these systems. And so I'm going to jump right in and we're going to have a deep conversation. Guys, if you, as you have questions, jump, drop them in the chat and we'll make sure that we get to them. 
and have an opportunity for you to engage in this conversation as well. Um, and so sisters, I'm gonna start off by asking you, um, and, and, and Reverend Erica has already really dived into it. Like how do we interrogate these Christian structures that uphold and oppress our people, black, brown, and indigenous communities across the, across the South? And even in liberal spaces, this is happening. So from your perspectives, how do we begin to interrogate these Christian, these structures and denominations? I'll say a short snippet. I have lots of questions around when we talk about how do we interrogate? So to even get to the rest of it, who, who is we, right? Who is we? I always listen, who is we? And then when we get into the we, me and Erica, Erica and I, because we have, we could sit in DC and talk about all the things all day long. And that's our we. But what happens, who, who is actually holding the ruler, like the actual ruler? Who is doing the measuring? Who is, who is in <clears throat> power to, to make change, to be in the room, to say the things, to hold up another ruler? And then also, who are people in accountability to, in accountability relationship with? Right. And so I have lots of questions. <laughs> I have lots of questions. You know, we, we're able when it's something like a movie or direct representation when it makes sense. So I think there's, you know, there's some new movie coming out and they've clearly cast some white man to be some Asian man. Right. And so when it's something that clear, we're like, oh, my gosh. And then the question becomes, who was in the meeting? Who was in the room? Who was at the casting thing? Who was asking questions? How did this get all the way through 14 editions and edits and all of the things, right? And so my, how do we set up structures of accountability so that it, at some point in the, at some point in the process, someone is able to say a something that says, this is not right. This is not just, this is not of God. This is some hot mess on fire, right? And that that person is not shot down, is not discarded, is not pushed out, is not considered the problem, more of a problem than the problem. So I have a questions about the measure, the ruler and accountability. That's that in order to do this interrogation, we got to get into that as well. So dive in. Who's the we? Uh, I'm looking to Mav and to Erica. Let's let's dive into it. Let's have that conversation. Well, one of the things I want to say also, the we in this conversation is Southern fund makers, funders who can uplift. So part of the conversation is what do you need to uplift? What do funders, what can the we of funders uplift to support the right things that can have these accountabilities, but also counterforces? And to me, the, the, the kind of mission and call is true, twofold. Clearly, funders need to fund the visionary prophetic voices, as we've heard from both Fahisha and Erica here. Um, that preach the real gospel, that lift that up, um, the gospel to the poor, not the gospel of the church that's locking people out, um, which many churches are. You know? so, so there's that kind of challenge, and it's a challenge from within, from within Christianity, from within those biblical texts that who are already inside one of the doors, although not you know, locked out of other ones there. And then there's people on the outside who are also dissidents and creating other traditions or other faiths already, those ecumenical movements and stuff. So what's the most effective of those now? Um, and how do we target these organizations? And then there's the social justice organizations that who have, the, have also the we of the people in them in various ways. But I do think in the South, there are really good organizations that have constituted, um, constituted that 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 force of, of oppressed people and the spiritual force of it and where do we fund there so i want the we to include the funders and the discussion to include what what um what is our best wisdom um about uh what money can do because it can be a force for good and bringing to scale the really vital things both to um keep our community safe with a vibrant spirituality and also um have the best counterforce to what we're up against now. 
Yeah, I agree with bo what both of my dear uh, comrades have offered. You know, it's so interesting. Um, we are the we. Um, and I say that in the context of wherever we are placed, wherever we have a sphere of influence, we have a responsibility to say something. And in particular, white folks, I'm going to keep it gangster with y'all. Y'all really do, because these y'all people. And I ain't trying to be rude. I love y'all. But at the end of the day, as a black person, I should not be doing y'all work. These y'all folk. So you should be having conversations with them about the ways that this is not Christianity, but white supremacy. And I'll be honest, y'all, I just graduated uh, from Harvard Divinity School back in May. Um, and I was a part of the inaugural cohort for the Religion and Public Life Program. Okay? Religion and Public Life Program at Harvard Divinity School. And in the whole year, the whole year of our time together talking through courses and all books and everything, we did not have one discussion on white Christian nationalism. Now, how are you gonna be at Harvard? And I'm just gonna get ghetto, Harvard, and not have one conversation about white Christian nationalism because Harvard is the institution that helped to create and helps to sustain white Christian nationalism in this country and around the world. And so I say that because as I was there this year and having to have conversations with various students and faculty, I began to ask the question, Fahisha, as you said, I began to say, so why is it that we're not talking about white Christian nationalism? Why are we not talking about the history of Harvard that has, they were trained when Harvard was started as a divinity school. I hope y'all know that. Like it was a divinity school and it was helped to train clergy and other leaders to go out and to keep this, this, this white Christian nationalism like, like idea in place. And so why is it if we're saying we're trying to dismantle, you know, everybody now is trying to dismantle and decolonize something, but yet and still you won't have a real conversation about the actual things that are impacting public life in America. But it's because, let's be clear, I said this in my class that day, I said those who are proximate to power, they pause. I said, and those who are proximate to pain, they push. I said, so majority of y'all are here with power. You don't want to say nothing because you're comfortable, because you eaten off of the tables of the folks who are uplifting white supremacy. So you don't want to talk about it, but it is the poor and dispossessed groups that are coming together to say, no, 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 no. We're not going to take this. That's what the Poor People's Campaign is. That is what Song is. I don't, I don't know all the demographics of it, but I know there are organizations saying we're going to stand up against this. And so I would challenge all of us myself included, how comfortable are we? Because the reason why I think a lot of these things are able to live is because we continue to feed them. And as our dear newly ancestor uh, Desmond Tutu said, if you are silent, you are on the side of the oppressed. And so I hope that all of us, wherever we are, are ringing the alarm to say, hey, as you said, Vahisha, the questions, who's not in the room? What are we not talking about? And are we really addressing the matter at hand? Because I need us to understand white Christian nationalism, if we look at every thread in this nation from poverty, from immigration, from LGBTQI rights, from going into to, to ecological devastation, the common thread is white Christian nationalism. I can bet you that. That is my name is Erica. I can bet you that. The common thread all boils back to white Christian nationalism. So will we? Will we ask the questions? One yeah, organization, a and it's a, it, you know, it, okay. If we're kind of uplifting what you might want to fund, <laughs> and in terms of like white people working with white people, I do think Surge or Southerners on um, <laughs> that song, Surge is showing up for racial justice, which was founded 10, 13 years ago by a set of white activists whose friends of color because the Tea Party had come along and the backlash to Obama was very clear. And we've certainly seen it in the last decade, like you white people, once again, the call, you need to do something, you need to do something. So a bunch of us, I was in on the early calls, not so much the middle, but I really respect the whole trajectory of the work. I mean, they've really worked very hard at it um, to figure out how to activate white people, how to invite white people in, not just be the coolest person as an anti-racist or, uh, have to be better than another white person or you might sink into some kind of guilt, but to really seriously reach out to white people in all different kinds of ways, all different kinds of contexts. Uh, one of the things Serge did was a little uh, paper, um, you know, one of the things you put under your dishes when you, at dinner, 
for white people to take home for Thanksgiving, which is usually a point of great conflict for ideological differences in white families, I have to tell you. Uh, and it gave little pointers. And they even had somebody on the phone, like a hotline, where if you were melting down or had, you know, had pushed some, some, you know, if there was that kind of thing that can really be paralyzing in a way, you could go call and see what you're going to do. Um, Search now has ch chapters in all the states. They have various kind of working groups, and they have a faith working group. And I like this sentence because I, I did I did Google a little bit to try to be ready for this. But um, let's see, um, white Christians can articulate a new mutual interest, liberated story about what it means to be human beyond whiteness, and how that connects the economic justice and abolitionist vision. Well, I think that's pretty good. I mean, if you could do that and could do that among white Christians in those conversations. So I know that's one of the places it's happened. Um, and I think from, I mean, I got a lot of nieces and nephews who were is Republican, everybody else in my family was. And, and then now they've got children. And I think that over the years I've noticed with my own family and other folks too, it's harder like we used to at least I used to be able to at least engage him on Jesus like you tell me what Jesus would have said about homosexuality you tell me you tell me that thing and now they don't care about Jesus I mean it's shocking to me <laughs> it's shocking to me that Jesus like they have become so pro close to power that they don't I don't think they teach Jesus I don't think they understand Jesus I mean I had this conversation once when I was trying to get my book sold at the Miami Book Fair with this woman who was the, the, I want to be quiet in a minute, but who was the uh, granddaughter of Fred Phelps, who was the God Hates Fags Church, you know, and I was trying to understand this, and I said, well, and she grew up with all of this indoctrination, had to break away from it, and I said, well, what do they do with the Good Samaritan? You know, like, this is kind of a key to everything about who your neighbor is, because somebody says, Jesus, how in the world do I understand all this stuff? So complicated. He said, two things, love you, the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, all your might, and you love your neighbor as yourself. It's pretty straightforward, more important than everything else. And then they say, well, who's my neighbor? And they tell the story of the Good Samaritan, who uh, was a Jew who had been beaten on the side of the road, and all the Jews passed, and the, all that, and it's the Samaritan who's the, who's in animosity with the Jew who picks him up and wipes him off and takes him home. And so it's not your neighbor is the most white person next to you in your little enclave neighborhood or your segregated church or whatever. It is the person most opposite from you who has been brutally attacked from that opposition. And she said, they don't teach the Good Samaritan. They don't teach the Good Samaritan. I said, holy shit, you know, like <laughs> that's a pretty good trick. So I think that they have left a big vacuum here because I do think Jesus is good news. I'm not in a congregation right now. I don't usually like come into this, but I've gotten some inspiration from my other panelists here. But, um, you know, like they have left the gap for a lot of white people anyway, that there is good news. I mean, they may not get it in their little uh, homeschool. You know, they may not get it in their church. They may not get it there, but but it can reach there because it reached me. It came in the windows of my segregated church. And I do think that it's that mission also of white people to teach the news. And we don't have to be these, these damaged and damaging people. And there's a fuller humanity there and it can give us our lives. We shouldn't be afraid of it. And it, there's a gospel to it and we should follow it. I, I put some of this in the in the chat while you were speaking, Mab, because um, you were given like some great context for a lot of things. So a couple of details that I added was that Surge came out of a gathering at Highlander. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that's known. And the reason that that becomes important, especially in the South, I don't know where y'all beloveds are from, but let me tell you something. Me and my Southern draw, we from North Cacalac, okay? Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> the way that the South moves is gentle, and it's easy, and it's slow, and we like us, and that is who we are. And a part of that is that we come out of each other. We are in relationship with each other. So Surge came out of a gathering at Highlander. So if Highlander wasn't funded, if Highlander wasn't a place, if they had if they had effectively stolen Highlander, because keep in mind, Highlander was a displaced, right? So Highlander is at its second location because white folks was white folky. Okay, so if if Highlander still didn't exist, then Surge would not be. 
So I'm not, I'm not saying that Surge is perfect or that Highlander is even perfect. I said that in the chat. None of none of our movements are. But if we, if we, if we're so some of so much of funding is project, project, do this, do that, very specific, right? But if Highlander wasn't funded, then Surge couldn't have been birthed. And there's no there's no call to funding that could have foreseen that. Right. Right. So what happens when you just fund what is existing, what is happening, because it is working and it is well work. So how do you fund the places and the people that become incubators for radical goodness is what I put in the chat. And I transform network for me is one of those. There are many song. Transform, there are so many versions of this where there is under resourced people and places who are incubators for this radical goodness, but not getting the support that it needs to for the glitzy whatever versions of the thing. And then the last thing I put in there is that the other thing about the way funding is structured is that again, particularly in the South, I can't speak to the other regions of you know this stolen land, but but in in the U.S. South. We're so connected. We're we're forget six degrees of separation, right? We six southern blocks of separation out here. So we are so connected. Our work is connected. Our people are connected. So when you put pit southern folks, southern organizations, southern work against each other for the same dollars, it is actually becomes counter of who we are and how we show up in the world. Not just ineffective to movement, if that also, but it's so countercultural to who we are. So how do we do a better job of that? Because if we want to counter this narrative of what Christianity can be, of what movement can be, of what freedom can be, we actually do believe that we are not free until all of us are free. And funding methods are not free. <laughs> They are not free because it's like, you may, you can, if, if I know you, or if you can provide this very particular package, if you package this exact way. So how do we, how do we extract that from the actual funding model? And I, I said this before we started, but um, track for movements and movement and faith in particular were benefactors, were uh, recipients of the Southern Power Fund. And if not for that Southern Power Fund, I would not even be able to do the work that's happening today in those two containers. Those two containers would be struggling in a way that is ridiculous. But if you walk around the South and you start talking about, hey, I'm still alive because I got this trauma support while you know Louisville was burning to the ground. But the funders won't hear that. But track was on the ground, right? That, so, so how do you... How do you as funders, how do we as folks move better together for, for this liberation that we're all seeking? So y'all all have touched on this quite a bit. And so I'm going to just ask the question. So let's talk about philanthropy for a minute and philanthropy role in holding up the systems around white Christian nationalism. Like, I think all of you have been talking about the folks that need to be get get funding, Surge, Song, Highlander, like all these amazing movement organizations across the South that are fighting every day to break down these systems um, that oppress our people and hold us away from our liberation. So what, in your opinion, does white Christian, white Christian nationalism represent to the philanthropic community? Well, to me, it's the whole shooting match. It would be a very big mistake to think that Marjorie Taylor Greene invented white Christian nationalism in July and everybody started writing about it, or that it's just one more of a whole list of bizarre right wing formations that you can put on a map and analyze from a new left kind of perspective and you've got the coolest analysis there. Uh, it is the whole map. It is the whole thing. It's colonialism, it's imperialism, it's Jim Crow, it's slavery. It's just because Christianity, a version of Christianity was mobilized to justify in spite of the gospel um, and defend all of those egregious brutal practices. So if you're not using, seeing that as the whole target, you're not only going to miss the center, you're going to be, you're going to shoot your arrows way off in the woods. I mean, this has got to be the whole thing and it has to be treated holistically now because we make, frankly, as somebody who's been tracking this for a long time, 
the contradictions are so heightened and they are so consolidated now after Trump with, with all the things that we all know about that we don't have a lot longer. We cannot take the platform we have now about elections and public policy and legislators and voting on things for granted. We cannot take it for granted. And so whatever shit we've been doing, uh, it would be better to refocus, let me just say that. And I think there, there are different trends in funding. When I was doing nonprofits in North Carolina 20 years ago, I, I eventually left it because I felt like I was being set up to fail because I was given too little money to do too much. And that's what we all have been given. We're taking on the biggest burdens in the planet. We're supposed to fix climate change on three, three, three years and out little funding or something like that. Or And then we have to, y'all may not do this now, but you had to really, let's say, politely exaggerate what you're going to do and nobody ever asked for an evaluation anyway and so then you got some more money maybe you know so um this so so definitely highlander those those grounding organizations who've managed to survive was no big deal i mean it's no little thing to be still alive since the 30s or the 90s or something and those innovative things that really need to go to scale and for instance, one of them, I don't know if y'all know, like the uh, mobile homecoming, it's Alexis Pauline Gun Gums and Shangador, Julia Roxanne Wallace, brilliant creatures, also just kind of cosmic beings um, who also ground themselves in Durham. And they um, have finally gotten a, a place, a house, 11 acres to ground a conference center, to promote black queer brilliance, especially people like Audre Lorde and Paula Murray, uh, and to bring queer BIPOC elders there too. And they need money, like they can go to scale with a major infusion right there. There's other places like that, that have, people have been working their whole lives and they can go to scale. So where do you identify those places that can go to scale and really give them the money to do it? You know, not just here's three steps for your house, but let's make this whole thing work. Just a couple of this. I love that. I'm going to give you all a moment to respond because, um, of course, you know, we're not allowed enough, allowed enough time to get through this conversation. So please dive in with your final thoughts around this. And then we do want to give, give some time to let to answer questions that are in the chat. Yeah. So I thank you all for uh, what you have raised. Um, in 2018, the Poor People's Campaign did an audit called The Souls of Poor Folks. America from 1967 uh, to current. And what we found at that time, leading con economists, scholars, activists, and then most important people who live these shits daily came together. And what they found was there were 140 million poor folks in America, okay? One, four, zero million poor or low income people in this country. So that was in 2018. And so we even found out then that every day, the minimum of 750 people die because of anti-poverty policies in this country. So now we've been through a global pandemic. We're still in it. Hell, we got monkeypox and everything else coming along now. And people are losing their jobs, losing their homes, losing so many things. So we can only imagine what the poverty rate is in this country now. And so I'm saying this because what we have to be really clear about in this country, yeah, we think uh, uh, cream, excuse me, cream is what uh, rules America. Cash rules everything around America. And I say that because the reason why we don't have access to the things that we need so that people can be well is because there was a system designed. People often say the system is broken. It is not broken. It's doing exactly what the hell it was created to do when it was started. And it is to keep people in poverty, to keep them oppressed and to keep them marginalized. And so I'm saying this in the context of the reason why white Christian nationalism is so important is because their main thing is all about who does not deserve, who is not made in the Ama Odia, the image of God. And so what we have to get clear about is the reason why so many people are dying in this country, why organizations don't have the money that they need to do what they need to do is because folks are funding, lifting up white Christian nationalism. Oh, don't get it twisted. On January 6th, you had people, po folk from Tennessee all over this country getting to D.C. so that they can march on January 6th. Where was they getting money from? 
I would ask some of you in the room today, did y'all give them some money? But let's be clear, churches were giving money. Let's be clear, organizations were giving money. And so what I really want us to understand is we got to get back to the heart of the matter in this, this equation. And it is poverty. It is the fact that we are trying to keep some without, not some, let me, let me clear that, majority without and a small portion with. And North Carolina being one of the places don't get it twisted, Franklin Graham and all of them. Y'all know in 2016, when Trump was running for president, he was going around the country doing a revival about bringing America back. And don't let's not begin to understand how much money he brought in on that tour. And I'm wondering where has that money gone? And I'm even bringing it even further to our political parties. You oftentimes have candidates that are able to get an access of money while those who really are trying to get in, and I'm not for no politician, let me just be real clear, because I believe that whenever we're going to change something, it's been from the people. I, I'm just, that's how I view it. But at the core, I'm understanding we have to use the political process to get further. But at the core, oftentimes the people running who really want to make change don't have the resources. But those who are not looking to do the right things are fully funded. So we got to interrogate that to really figure out where are these funds coming from and remember that at the core of this, it's about money. It's about having people who have been well established all these years to stay in power. Why these poor white folk, let's be real clear, in that audit we did in, 19, uh, in 2018, 67 million of those poor folks were white. They look like majority of y'all on this Zoom screen today. But what they'll tell you that is black folk and brown folk and first nation folk and got folks thinking they gotta run around with scraps when there is no scarcity in this country. They lie about austerity budgets and other things, but we know America has enough money. T Tupac told us, he said, we got money for wars, but can't feed the poor. We helping everybody else, but we don't wanna do what's going on here. And that is all a part of this thread of white Christian nationalism mm -hmm. in order to keep those who have been in power in power and keep those who are oppressed in the margins. I don't know if it was clear, but I felt it in my heart and I said it because I need us to understand, we got to get to the heart of this. It's about poverty. This thing is about money. And whenever you follow the money, you will find the power. Venetia, I'm gonna let you round this out. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm over here writing a dissertation in the chat because I'm from North Carolina and Franklin Graham sends my whole body. I said that visceral. Tennessee Coates talked about that visceral. Um, so I, I, I wasn't prepared. I will say, I will say um, back to back to that, back to that introduction piece, both saying follow the money. Yes, Erica, uh, Reverend Erica, follow the money. And the challenge that you said, follow your money, right? So follow also your money. And I think about that challenge, right? Even for myself. And then I want us to be as embodied as possible to not divorce, to not divorce our bodies from this process. Um, Mab started off talking about how it felt in her body, what she experienced with these realizations of the impact of racial injustice. And so for all of us who have bodies, everybody on here, hey, hey bodies, hey people, how y'all doing? Hi. <sighs> Pay attention to them. Listen to what the bodies are trying to tell you. And when you feel, when you feel that fear, when you feel that discomfort, we're talking about ways we're uncomfortable and ways to break through privilege, ways to acknowledge privilege, ways to even deal, to come to a reckoning of what we, how we may have operated in the past. And that does not have to be how we go forth in the future. And so pay great attention to, to how we're moving, take your bodies with you, be really embodied about this process so that when something feels off, it's because it's off. When some when someone brings someone brings something that makes you uncomfortable, that there's discomfort available, how about sit in that? sit in that and process that rather than try to smooth it over in a way that erases what may need to be lifted. We may need to be uncomfortable. And, and to be clear, it, it being in a black, black body, we, I'm uncomfortable all the time, right? All, whew, all the dang time. So the very, the very most least you could do 
is to sit in discomfort in your processes, sit in discomfort in what change is gonna take. It will cost you something. It will cost you something. But what we what we could reap all together, it's worth it, y'all. It's worth it. So we got a few seconds, few more minutes before we break out. And so I just wanna, I wanna, I, I really wanna just hear, hear y'all share. So GSP has always been that space where we speak directly to philanthropy and we talk about what they need to do to be in an accountable relationship with the movement. So I, I want to hear you all have worked with movement organizations across the South for almost all of your entire careers. And so speak directly to funders right now that are in this space and that will see this recording. What do they need to be to do to begin to break down their structures around white Christian nationalism? But more importantly, what do they need to do to be in an accountable relationship with movement that supports their work, that funds their work? Right off gate, I'm gonna say not just, the relationship shouldn't just be to fund movement folks. Movement folks need to be in governance and decision-making power about where the funding is going. That right there, that, that's, that's a, uh, so if you don't have movement folks who are deciding, who are a part of the process of where the funding is going, then the, the, the power, just, just, just even look at the power dynamic of that. So you're holding the money, and you're like, oh, good little movement people will give you these funds, right? But you shift this pa paradigm shift of that power would be that movement folks are involved in where the money is going, not just to them, but to others. Because I just named that, especially in the South, we are all in relationship. So guess who's going to know where the funding should go? Us. Guess who's going to know who is doing effective work that is uplifting Black, Brown, Indigenous, trans, you know, birthing bodies us <laughs> so if y'all are just talking amongst yourselves this is just some beautiful funded or not beautiful funded nepotism right but become become a little more the directionality of the accountability should not just be going this way but it should be an entering in there should be a continued and ongoing relationship with actual movement folks in the funding process, not for just one funding season, one funding initiative, period, and always. Erica, Mav, Mav, you're on, you're on, you're on mute. My yard man's out there with the leaves, so I was trying not to bring him into the conversation, but as long as we're talking about white Christian nationalism, Christian fascism, perhaps. Um, I think it's important to just acknowledge what a crisis we're in about it and how close these power people are to really getting a lock on the, on the levers of power as we've understood them in terms of governance, in terms of Supreme Court and all this stuff. You know, like, it's not like, oh, well, maybe we'll do it next decade or so. I mean, we really are in a crisis, but it's also an opportunity because so many people are being damaged by the system. And if you just look at Roe versus Raid and how many women realize, oh my God, like I can't get an abortion across 10 states or, you know, I mean, it really is at a crisis proportion. And, and, and so many more people, I mean, there's all the Trump people, but they are a minority, but what they want is minority rule. I mean, I grew up in minority rule, 15% white people control 85% black people. And they want that rule and they know the law, the arc of the universe isn't bending towards them demographically or anything else and they got to do it now. So um, I do think it's a kind of all hands on board moment. Um, and I think there's opportunities in that to let more people in, to be more focused, but funders, I mean, I think that we need to be strategic about what I'm not, I'm not saying nobody in here isn't strategic, but in North Carolina anyway, what I'm trying to do having mapped the right for a long time is get is really, and, and I know that maybe Southern Property Law Center's on here, Political Research Associates are the groups now that are, that are doing a lot of the mapping of the right, but they're doing it more abstractly. I mean, the map of North Carolina has got like 25 little dots on it. We've got a hundred counties and there's 25 dots in every county, you know? So I'm working with Blueprint North Carolina and we're, wanting to use voter civic engagement money to protect black and brown communities, not to just protect the vote or the voter, but the communities and the people and the lives, um, kind of to use that money 24 seven, 12 months 
but also to know where <clears throat> the opposition is and be able to kind of map it by county, working with our people to know where dangers and possibilities are. And I do feel like, um, anyway, and I do feel like, like you, if you watch anything MSNBC, oh my God, our democracy is at risk. Well, it's always been at risk and there's people who never got it, but it is at risk. But so what do we do then? I mean, I feel like our, fund, I feel like our political strategies need to work if and when it works or it doesn't work. I mean, we don't need to be relying too much on old models of philanthropy, giving it to get the public policy from the state that's being, that's kind of getting dissolved underneath this. It needs to be different strategies. And I'm sure communities are talking about them. So the Movement Assembly is another great place out there that's doing this kind of local governance work. Uh, and and it's it's urgent, it's urgent. Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's very urgent. Um, and it's it's life or death right now, y'all. Like, yeah. as we're sitting here talking, like I'm over here, like my grandma. I feel like I'm just rocking and and, and shaking because I'm like, I don't think we understand the magnitude and the urgency of what we are living in. Yeah. And so my spirit is sitting here like, ah, just, I, I, the other day I just cried out because I was like, what are we doing? And asking for us to get guidance. And, and as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about where your money is, is where your heart is. Where your money is, is where your heart is. And so I would ask the question of funders, where is your heart? And so, King, and I'm quoting a lot of King today. I don't know what's up with all of this, but I'm gonna go ahead and quote the King, you know, said that he didn't wanna give a coin to a beggar. He wanted to know the system that created a beggar. And so oftentimes philanthropy, oftentimes, now correct me y'all, I'm, I, I, I'm not fully aware on all this, but oftentimes it is a case of you just wanna do charity. You want to throw a few dollars, but you're not seeking justice. And so we got to go back to this heart matter to find out really, what is it you're really trying to do when you're funding? And not only when you're funding, like, who are you funding? Because what I'm looking at in a lot of ways, a lot of organizations that I know, like down in the South, my sister, who I just talked to the other day, she's in Mississippi, in Jackson, like doing some real, like real deep organizing down in Chula, down in the, in, in, in the Delta. And she's scrambling, trying to get scraps to make sure that the folks have what they need there. Like, what the hell? Like, this is work that should be funded, shouldn't be a question. You shouldn't have to even be worried about if you got the money because of the fact you got all these folk walking around here talking about they helping Mississippi. Well, who the hell are you helping down there where the majority of the most impacted folks don't have what they need? So I ask you, philanthropist, where's your heart? We got to check the heart level because what I think it is is true is that we're doing a lot of good charity. But who are we giving the charity to? You better get deeper than that and really find out about these organizations that's really doing the work. And I'm just going to be very clear. A lot of them are the black, the brown, the indigenous, poor, trans folk, because a lot of these organizations that we giving funding to, a lot of these liberal organizations, because y'all do know who y'all liberals are. King told y'all the worst is the, the, the white moderates. And I'm going to just say it like I feel it, the liberals. We very liberal about stuff, but we ain't really too liberal about trying to dismantle these systems that are keeping us oppressed because of the fact white supremacy we know is the issue. But a lot of times we don't want to address it. And I want to lift up a couple things in the chat since this is for the recording. Uh, Ash Love, oh my gosh, so good, talked about um, a redistribution and, and talk, I mean, I, and I, I can't find it quick enough, but somebody want to read that, a redistribution even of these resources. And the one that struck me, um, they lifted several, but the one that struck me was land. Y'all, I mean, especially now being at Claiborne's, um, Claiborne Temple and and, and thinking about the element of place, right? And, and to have a place to go to, a place where organizing can happen, a place that represented a thing, a place where, so we're not having to do house, house parties in order to organize the revolution, right? Not that that can't happen, but, but I, I wonder 
if if there are funding and I could not know because they ain't calling me to give me no land. But I wonder if there are funders who are not just giving money, who are not just offering um, money resources, but land, like giving land back to folks who will do beautiful revolutionary things with it. And then also uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Wavette Blair said, philanthropists should also dismantle the barrier of having grant funding cycles that place calendar limits on when orgs can apply. And that is really huge. I'm Listen, I'm about to miss out on some money right now just because I was so destabilized that my org couldn't get it together to even try to apply for some things. We're still going to try it, right? But to miss these windows um, that don't fit maybe the the rhythm and the flow of movement work, right? So if 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 you on the ground in the middle of tear gas, maybe you can't meet the deadline for, for the for this really long application for a thing. And so someone else commented like not even being able to apply at all. And and very similar, I, I'm not gonna say like I get that you got to have some kind of hey, how do we give you this money? But what I what I know again is that being um having gotten the Southern Power Fund. It wasn't a matter of now you have to justify to us how you are using every last one of these dimes in this way. It was, we know you and we know the work that you're capable of and that you are doing. Use these funds to move this work. And that's what happened. So let's do that. Let's do more of that. Was there more in the chat, y'all? Anybody can read? But I think, but I think here's the thing though, oftentimes we can't do that because we're not in community with the folks who are in need at of all. Community. At right? all. And, and that's right, which is which is what was different about the Southern Power Fund. It was a group of folks who were actually doing the work who who both determined and distributed and communicated with folks to give out that work. And that's the only that's the only model that I'm directly aware of, right? Like I had a real person who knew me call me up on the phone. And and I want to lift up at the end of the brief application because it was it was brief, thank God. At the end of the brief application, guess what it asked? It said who else should we be in relationship with? Who else should we give money to? And it had three places where you could lift up other people who were doing great work. I've never had a funder ask me who else to give money to. It was amazing. It was amazing. I think that's critical. And I think the last part is we should look at the ways in which we're trying to make people jump through hoops to get the funding. I think you've already said that. But in some ways, like my sister Danielle, who's in Mississippi, like she shouldn't even have to be giving out no application and doing any of that. Like, the work is being done, like trust us, like, you know what I mean? Cause I think that's another form of that white supremacy that I've got to fill out all these papers and keep all track of this. I'm sorry, that's just in a lot of ways how I view that because that's another sense of control. So why is it that we can't just allow for folks to have the resources that they need to do the work that they need to do? Cause oftentimes what misses this is a lot of folks don't have the opportunity or the resources to write grants and do other things. So can we re-envision the way we give funding out to people in, in the organizations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought of one thing, and one of the things that I have seen late in the last 10 years or so, there's a lot of white money floating around, a lot of it, and some of it's like Bezos' wife has given like millions to folks for, I mean, you know, weird, weird kind of a lot of money, little money things, but there's also a lot of intergenerational wealth of white people that's like on the verge, you know, your mom was 103 or your aunt so-and-so or whatever, you know, and I do think that one of the things Southern Power, that was one of the campaigns, I think, I know Song was doing it some for Southern Power um, was to like give white people opportunities to give some of that back, you know, to deed it back or to hand it over or whatever. And I think that that's, um, you know, millennials and, and not millennials, but baby boomers, we're baby boomers. I'm grand baby boomer right now, but, um, you know, so so that I think that there's a conversation among philanthropists about how to encourage that individual wealth donation, and we shouldn't forget that because we're all sitting on Muscogee land. It's been plantations on it, and there's been a lot of accumulation of wealth for too many centuries um, that individuals could give up. I thank you for all of that you all have shared. You know, we've mentioned the Southern Power Fund quite a bit. And, you know, as a person that's been involved with the Southern Power Fund, what I know about those movement leaders, what they wanted to have an opportunity to take resources and redistribute it to the networks that they knew that existed, that they knew were already doing the work and doing it in good relationship with folk and communities on the ground. 
Um, and for us, it's a model of how philanthropy should exist. It's a model for how philanthropy can be in the right relationship with movement um, to redistribute the wealth that's been stolen from this from from our land, from people and coming people that look like us for generations. Um, and so those are just one model. And I know that there are other models like Contigo and, and, and other movement organizations. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we wanna think about in doing this work is how do we redistribute wealth in a way that really empowers and really strengthens the capacity of people that are on the front lines of this work, frankly, given their lives. Um, so I really thank you all for lifting up um, and Benicia, you took it back because that's exactly what I was going to do. I was going to chat and pull the stuff out. Um, but I really do want to give folks an opportunity, like if there are any final thoughts or any final questions, please take an opportunity to lift them up. Um, our goal here at GSP is to make sure folks get funded for the work that they're doing and that they get funded to the level in which they deserve to be funded because they are the one that are transforming systems every day for the benefit of our people and for the benefit of our people's liberation. Um, and so please lift up your thoughts, have an opportunity. I'm gonna give folks an opportunity to close out, um, give our panels a, the opportunity to say some final words. But if there are other thoughts that folks wanna lift up in the chat, please take an opportunity to do that. I love that very concrete, what's happening in the chat that funders can give, somebody say the words, I'm not looking at it, but funders can give 25% of their fund this year to the Southern Power Fund. And is it, um, I think a website was given and, or how that, what, how that can look like. That's huge, that's huge right there. So your excuse is not, oh, okay, I don't know who, I don't know. Here you go. You can be in relationship with people who do know, who are in relationship. It is key right now to get money in large amounts that make a difference to very responsible people who have worked their whole lives without enough money to do what is desperately needed right now. You know, and so this is not dribs and drabs. This is like put your funds together and you know, like Southern Power Funds one, there's other intermediary funds like that, but um, those people deserve they deserve the funds to do what their life has brought them to, what they were born to do and hadn't had the money. And because they're in relationship with other movement organizations, Absolutely. they need to get Absolutely. the money too. Absolutely. And they know the strategies that need to be- They supported. would share it, they would put it in the right places, yeah. And, and, and that's, we're not to say that the Southern Power Fund is the end all be all, it is places one model. Like that. Places and like that. Places places like there are models across the South. The South has real infrastructure, you all. And we yeah. have to find those places to infuse those resources so that infrastructure can be solidified in a way where folks have the dollars and the resources to do their work. Yeah, and that's the part where I wanted to ask the question as thinking as an organizer, how are we organized? Like how do we know exactly across the South where, um, like, is there a connection? Like, is there a thread that can keep all of the various, and I'm not saying like we know everything, but I think there needs to be some kind of discussion of what is actually happening in the South and where are these places so that we can begin to say, okay, here's where we need to send funding here. Like, I don't know. I mean, some folks may not even have access to get to the table. Like, I think in some ways, this is even a privileged conversation in a lot of ways to be in this because I'm thinking of real poor folks, like sometimes who don't have all the, the nonprofit, they don't have all that, but they're doing some great work. What does that do for them? How are they able to get funding? Um, because I, like I said, I know a bunch of folks, in, I got a friend now in Arkansas who's been like using all her money, like to help to like do this work in one of the schools at Little Rock. Actually, where the, what's the Little Rock Nine uh, area? Like where that school was, we know the history of Little Rock Nine. So I'm like, she's there doing a lot of work, like organizing with students and doing things. So I just, I don't know. I think we gotta begin to start thinking out the box, out of the ways that we have done giving funding traditionally and start thinking about these real grassroots folks in a lot of ways who are really doing some really badass work. So we gotta think about who's not even in these conversations and who don't know the activists like Vahisha or Mab. Like there's some grandmamas who doing some stuff that need to be funded in the way she's helping children. Mm -hmm. Whoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oof. All right. So y'all, we're going to take a breath. 
We, 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 we <laughs> received a lot. We've heard a lot. Mm-hmm. And now we have to figure out a way to put action what Erica just lifted up. GSP is here as a resource. We're trying to be in right relationship with movement and we're trying to organize funders to put dollars and resources in the South where they belong. Um, and so join us, join us in the conversation, help us to figure out ways to continue this conversation moving. Um, our annual membership meeting is coming up in, in, in September 8th and 9th. If you are a member of GSP, you already know you're gonna be at the table. If you are not a member of GSP, I encourage you to be there because this is where we organize ourselves to be in right relationship and to figure out how we in- increase the infrastructure in the South around these movement organizations. We have the opportunity to do what we know we need to do and to do our work so that communities that are doing their work do not have to suffer any longer. Um, mm-hmm. And so please join us September 8th and 9th as we continue this conversation, as we have the opportunity to further figure out where these groups are that we know that we don't know and how we be in conversations about how we bring it all together, how we figure out what the structures are that we need to be supporting and investing in those structures. And so now's the time to take action. Now's the time to take what you've learned today, digest what you've learned today and and put it into action. We don't want you to just say, I attended this session. That's not the point. We want you to take the information that you gained and figure out how you take it back to transform the systems in which you work in. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I thank you for the time that you spent with us today. Um, And I look forward to seeing you at our membership meeting and in communities. Uh, Erica said it best, you can't do this work from your your foundation. You got to get in community and do work with them. And so I look forward to seeing you in the South as we continue to do this work. You all have a great day and I want everyone to come off mute if you can come off mute. And I want you to lift up uh, Reverend Venetia, Reverend Erica and Mab for the wonderful uh, opportunity that they took with us today to just l- to lean into us and share what, what they have to offer. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate who thank you, you are and what you bring to this. Yeah. Thank you so much, y'all. All right. Everybody have an amazing day and we will see you all soon.